Hey everyone, I'm Chris Lesniak. I'm Rob Beyer, and this is the Debate Math Podcast. Well, it's final exam season, so we thought it'd be good to take time to get into a debate about tests. A debate that's been around for years has only increased in intensity over the last three or four years. Should we continue using paper tests, or is it time to give digital tests solely? Which way is easier? Which method is best for teaching and learning? Should we stick with paper, or is it time to get digital? Sounds like a great debate to me. Yes. So arguing for digital exams, we have two awesome educators. First up is a longtime math educator, having taught sixth grade through AP Calc at a public charter and private schools, a Desmos fellow, a writer of the blog, I Speak Math, and an all-around math cheerleader, Julie Roebuck. Hi, Julie. Hey, how's it going? Whoa. Hey, can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Yeah, um, right now I live in Lake Norman. It's about 20 miles north of Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, right now I am tutoring and helping out teachers in my area, subbing a little bit and going around giving presentations occasionally. So uh, that's what I've been doing the past year. Awesome. Welcome. And arguing alongside her is someone who dropped out of middle school and high school and college before finally getting going back and getting a degree on his mother's orders the founder of Desmos, who learned to program on his TI-83 graphing calculator, Eli Luberoff. Hi, Eli. Hello. So happy to be here. So I know we just kind of said it, but could you let everybody know where you are and what your current role is? Uh, so where I am is a very complicated question. It depends on the day and the week and the month and the year. Uh, currently recording from Oakland, California, living in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, awesome. Well, welcome. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and I run uh, Desmos Studio PBC now, the public benefit corporation that creates um, the graphing calculators and other tools that, uh, that that we're known for and that I love building so much. So, so happy to have you both here. So can you, uh, now the question that we ask all of our guests, when did math first become controversial to you? Julie, we're going to start with you. Great, thanks. Um, so math first became controversial to me my first year of teaching. Uh, as a brand new teacher, I'd been given the lowest level of classes. <laughs> my students were not very motivated. They hated math and they really did not enjoy my class. Um, so I decided to show them the beauty and the fun of math and I started teaching lessons where they discovered math, they can work and talk together about their discoveries. And it really turned my class around. Um, so I was really surprised when I started getting pushback from the other math teachers in my department. They didn't think I was being rigorous enough. Um, and I felt like I had to fight every day just to teach the way that was in the best interest of my students. And that just really surprised me because it never occurred to me that teaching a different way would be considered controversial, especially since my students were improving and finally learning so much math. Thank you, Julie. And Eli, when did math first become controversial to you? Uh, so this is one of my earliest school memories. I'm in first grade and um, my teacher asks a question, uh, draws a rectangle and says, divide this into four equal pieces. Um, and I think the expectation was maybe like three vertical lines. So you get four stripes or a cross so that you get four uh, rectangles. Um, and I did two diagonals because I knew that was gonna be more precise. I could like hold my ruler through, through the corners. Um, and it came back and she told me that I was wrong. Um, she said those weren't equal. Um, and I said, but, but they, but they are, I promise. And I was in first grade. I took it like really hard. I think I probably cried. Um, I oh. came back the next day and I had like a proof that they were equal. I drew in the cross and I'm like, look, it splits each one of these in half. And she's like, I don't care. You're still wrong. When I said equal, I meant equal shape. Um, like the same exact shape congruent. Um, and, and I remember it was the first and, and honestly, maybe only time in my memory where um, I didn't feel like my math ideas were being appreciated. Uh, and I'm someone who just is like consistently the kind of person whose math ideas are validated all the time. Um, and so I think so much about all of the kids who get that kind of signal um, every single day in math class and then come out being like, yeah, maybe I don't know math, but like I had, I had this idea and, and there was controversy about what it meant for things to be the same. Um, and it just stood out to me so much. And it makes me extra grateful every time that I hear stories like Julie's just now about 
an approach to teaching that is much more inclusive of students' ideas and celebrating of the kind of varied brilliance that shows up in classrooms, because there was one time that that didn't happen for me. Thank wow, wonderful. Well, thank you both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And arguing against them, we have a team of two wonderful, lovely educators. Uh, first up, we have a middle and high school teacher of 23 years, a Desmos fellow and a Desmos certified presenter, also a once diehard couch potato who has turned into a workout fanatic, Kathy Henderson. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? So I'm currently teaching sixth and seventh grade at a independent school in Berkeley, California, which is just east of San Francisco. And uh, my students are super excited to hear that I was on here. So if they're <laughs> listening, hi, y'all. Good to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. And arguing along with her is an army wife, a boy mom, an experienced math educator who started college as a fine art major, thinking she would paint her way through the world and who says food is her love language. It's Patricia Vandenberg. Hi, Patricia. Hello. Can Thanks you for having know? me on here. So excited. Yeah, glad to have you. Can you let us know where you are and what your current role is? Yes. Okay. So I am a Southern California girl that is up here in beautiful Meridian, Idaho. Um, we're just the city just west of Boise, the state capital. Um, and I am literally living my dream up here in my dream role as the math curriculum coordinator for the largest district in Idaho, West Ada School. Oh, wow. Wonderful. And now the question we want to ask all of our guests, when did math first become controversial to you? And Kathy, I'll throw it to you first. So when I was in middle school, I was part of a gifted program back in the 90s. And um, part of the gifted program was we had the opportunity of being on an academic team. And I was all excited to go out there and compete academically. And for the most part, it was a math team. Like we were going out and doing math competitions. And I, to this day, still remember people making comments because I was the only girl on the team. And they thought it was odd to have a girl who was interested in math wanting to compete. Um, and luckily enough, my dad said, you can do this, you can do anything you put your mind to, and girls belong in the STEM, what we now call STEM. And so I continued my studies in math, but um, to this day, I still remember how classmates made comments, so. Thank you for sharing. And Patricia, when did math first become controversial to you? For me, it was when I started teaching geometry. And I learned really quickly that there are teachers that are super specific and want things done in a very exact way. Things have to be done step-by-step, step. things have to be written in a certain way. And I fell into that in my first years of teaching because these were who my mentors were. Like I was you know, being mentored by these veteran teachers that I taught with. And then eventually I started to recognize like we are getting hung up on the details. Like, and it is a huge win when I can get students to understand the bigger picture, the bigger concept. Um, and do, if they miss some of the details along the way, that's okay. Um, but really similar to Julie, like I was looked at as I was not rigorous enough, that I didn't know my math content well, even though my students were literally walking out of class, recognizing that they liked at least some part of math. I was changing the way that they perceived themselves as maybe not being a math person or not liking math. I helped them to really recognize like, hey, no, you are good at this. You can be good at this. And it's because I'm honoring your thinking and the way that you want to represent um, how you understand math. Um, but yeah, I just remember it being super controversial, especially when it came down to like memorizing certain steps or memorizing certain formulas. I remember throwing out on Twitter and saying to everyone like, hey, do we really need to memorize like the 30, 60, 90 rule in right triangles? Like, do we really need that? And I just remember like that just being like such a hot topic. Like I got so many messages about that because we have the math educators that are like purists and like say like, you have to learn all the things. And then the ones that are like, hey, you know, it's not necessarily as useful as maybe these other tools that do other things like, you know, trig. Um, so yeah, teaching geometry. Very good, thank you. And with that, let's get into the debate.
We begin with opening statements from each of our speakers. You each have two minutes to present your arguments. And we are starting with the side arguing for digital exams with Julie Robach. Julie, you're up and your time begins now. Tests suck and we all know it. Teachers know it and students especially know it. Our claim is that we should incorporate digital assessments in order to make tests suck less for everyone. Currently, most states and even the SAT have incorporated technology on their exams. It will greatly benefit students to practice using this technology in a testing environment before taking these high stakes exams. Teachers can benefit as well as they will have an electronic record of student work. With paper tests, students have to wait for feedback until after the test is finally graded. With digital assessments, teachers can monitor students as they work and then give students valuable feedback while they are testing, not just after the test. Using digital assessments relieves student stress. Think of your students who know the math, but do not perform well on assessments because of test anxiety. Digital assessments allow students to immediately verify their work is correct, which is validating and thus calming for students. But my favorite benefit of using digital assessments is that students have the opportunity to learn while assessing. I want my students to learn math every day, even on test day. Digital assessments can notify students of incorrect answers. This gives the student an opportunity to reevaluate their work while testing, discover and correct their mistakes, and then learn from those mistakes. This allows students to discover new things and make new connections while testing. So please consider going digital for assessments. Thank you, Julie. And now we will hear from the side arguing for paper exams. Patricia, you are up first and you have two minutes and it begins now. So assessments in math class come in many forms and structures. And I think what's important to recognize is that assessments should be used for teaching and learning. Teachers don't just teach they're actually managers of student learning and assessments are part of that learning process. And because of this viewpoint, my claim is that paper assessments are better than digital assessments. And my warrant is paper assessments capture student thinking and provide opportunities for effective feedback for both the teacher and student to improve student learning. Brilliant minds in math education have worked so hard to shift this idea of doing math or being good at math away from just getting the answer right to honoring the process of getting that answer right. And when we talk about students being good at math, I believe we're talking about students being good problem solvers and communicators. And we want students to think deeply in our math classes. And so assessment should reflect this belief. So paper assessments, they allow students to show their thinking, like literally, there's literal space on their paper for students to work out the problem. Students are able to show their work in ways that make sense to them without having to navigate a digital platform where maybe symbols and diagrams may be challenging to use and incorporate into their work. And then teachers then have evidence of student thinking to inform their own instruction. Teachers literally have the student work to analyze and determine where each student is in their understanding of whatever the topic was taught. And they don't have to wonder how a student arrived at the answer. And that same evidence of student thinking also creates an opportunity to give students effective feedback on how to improve. And so there needs to be a shift in what assessments mean for math class. And while assessments are needed to calculate grades, assessments should primarily be used to inform instruction and provide meaningful feedback to students. So because paper assessments capture student thinking more effectively, paper assessments are better than digital. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Eli on the side promoting digital exams. Eli, you have two minutes and your time begins now. Fantastic. I'd like to use my first minute to just say I agree with every single word that Patricia just said, and I've got no further thoughts. Um, no, I actually do. So. Uh, one, one thing that people are often surprised when they hear this from me is that I'm deeply skeptical and quite bad at using tech. Um, I think that a huge number of the ways that tech is used in society and especially in classrooms 
is quite destructive. And I think that it's true in assessments, perhaps most of all. Um, but I think that that is about the way that we're using tech as opposed to whether tech has a place and has a role. And I think about using appropriate tools strategically. Uh, MP7, I believe. Um, MP5? Someone help me out. MP5. MP5 it is. Um, fantastic. And so when I think about some of the ways that technology is beneficial in instruction, a lot of them carry over to uh, assessment as well. One of them, as my partner Julie mentioned, is the opportunity for revision and the opportunity for feedback and the result that that has on learning. On paper, if you're doing an assessment and you get something wrong, you have no idea until maybe a year later or possibly not. <laughs> if you're doing this on a computer instead, you can immediately get feedback. And if that feedback isn't just you're right and wrong, it's actually interpretive, which computers can do when used correctly, it can help guide you to revise your answer, to come up with something new, um, or even just to be able to go on to the next step of the problem without being stuck because you weren't able to do the first part. When this is done best, it not only teaches you new things, but it also allows us to assess more interesting skills than just do you understand the mathematics, like um, how is perseverance and can you respond to feedback and learn from it? Um, do you have regret, resilience? Are you um, picking up on cues and deepening your thinking as a result of doing this? So my claim here is that we absolutely should be judicious in our use of technology, but used correctly, it can allow us to assess possibly even more interesting things and get information back to the student and teacher faster. Thank you, Eli. And finally, arguing again for paper exams, we have Kathy. Kathy, you have two minutes and your time begins now. Thank you. Imagine opening your computer and taking an end of unit test. The questions offer requ offered require a deep level of thinking, but your answers are conveyed in numerical or multiple choice options. You submit the answer alone, not how you thought through the problem, not how you went through the steps to find the solution. Now imagine receiving feedback that your answer is wrong. You knew you almost had the answer, but you made a calculation error. Unfortunately, a computer was not able to experience it. It could only evaluate your answer alone. This is how my students experienced math class in the days of shelter in place in spring of 2020. It was a different experience for all of us and I struggled to change in my usual methods of assessment. I had no choice but to use digital platforms for their summative assessments and felt that at the end of the year, I didn't have a full idea of what my students understanding was of the topics we had covered. I had not seen their full thinking, their steps, their mistakes, or their aha moments. My students love to show their step-by-step -step brilliance. Last week, I gave my students a survey and I asked them which method of assessment they'd prefer. Out of 76 of them, 62 said they would prefer pencil and paper assessment. They want to show their strategies and their methods. They appreciate my feedback and are eager to revise their work. The cycle of assessment, feedback, and revision plays an important role in my students' deeper understanding of math. My claim is that paper and pencil summative assessments allow students to have greater opportunities to demonstrate their brilliance, receive timely feedback, and then with revisions, a deepening of their understanding of mathematics. My warrant is that students do achieve greater learning outcomes when working on paper. And uh, this is supported by a study of paper and pencil assessments versus digital by Hinckley, Heffernan, and Bouige in 2020. The study found that students were encouraged to work on pencil and paper outperform their peers by 13 points. My students are juggling a lot. And then it's my job to help them find strategies and enable them to become thoughtful, logical mathematicians. And this cycle of showing their thoughts and their feedback from me and then the revisions enable them to achieve this goal. And I just ran out of time. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you all. Well, that was a great opening. Uh, I, I hear lots of similar themes on both sides about the, the feedback cycle of, of, of giving students feedback, revising, and so on. So you're both claiming that that your style will give the best feedback cycle. So maybe I'll, I'll start there. And, and I'm going to start, Patricia, Kathy, I'm going to come right to you because you were the, the last team to go here. Um, why do you think paper gives the best uh, advantage for that feedback cycle? I was going to say, I, when I uh, surveyed my students last week, I asked their opinions of it because they've been through this whole process and they've seen both sides of it. And they told me with paper, they feel more comfortable making mistakes. They feel comfortable kind of erasing things, scratching things out. They also said they don't feel rushed. They feel like they have the time and the space to figure out all of those steps. Sorry, go ahead, Patricia. 
No, I agree. And when, you know, students have that space on their paper, they can write out their work. And then that is evidence of their student thinking and teachers can track it. Students can, teachers can look at their work and say, okay, here's where you started. Here's where you ended. Here's where you made a mistake. And we can pinpoint um, in a lot of cases, like here exactly is where, you know, you went wrong. You made a small calculation error or, um, oh, here's maybe where a student stopped their thinking. And so it gives that evidence of their thinking and then teachers can give feedback on where like, hey, here's where you, were, where you stopped or here's where your mistake was. Um, and then giving that feedback to the student to say, okay, you wanna know how to raise your grade or you wanna know how to do better in this class, like here's where the mistake was and here's how you can fix it. And then I love Kathy's example of like, how your students being excited for revisions. Like once they know where their mistake is and if they know it's something small or, oh my gosh, like that was a silly mistake that I made, they can run back in and then go ahead and make that revision. Um, with digital assessments, it's not always clear what the evidence of student thinking is. It's sometimes questionable, but when it's a paper assessment, like it's literally all there. Even if it's blank, that tells you something. Well, on that note, let me bring it to Julie and Eli. So thinking about this feedback cycle, you, you claim digital is helpful, but they're saying that there's things missing, right? You, you just click on a, click a multiple choice answer and you move on. So can you talk about why digital could be really useful in that feedback cycle? Um, I'd like to just say that um, I think that what they're talking about are like probably not the best digital assessments. So I think we need to move the conversation from not just digital versus paper, but the right kind of digital. Yes, numerical multiple choice answers there. You, you see nothing like those are the worst kind of digital assessments. Uh, the ones that we're talking about are ones where you can do feedback. Um, I, I use Desmos for assessments and use Delta Math where you can create your own questions. Students can enter step by step. Um, there's, I, I rarely use multiple choice or numerical answer questions on e any of those because those do stress students out and you don't get a lot of information. Um, there are so many different things you can do digital, digitally and it's not really that difficult. There's a lot of formats out there and with all the different screens that we have available, especially in Desmos, uh, there are so many more things you can do that really do show students thinking. And as far as feedback goes, what I love is when I have a classroom of students in front of me and they are, they're working away on an assessment, I'm sitting at my computer and I can see what they're all doing. And so if a student gets stuck or if they're going way down the wrong path, they're getting frustrated, I can see that from my computer. And in Desmos, I can type a little note to them that pops up and they can read it and like, you know, it can redirect them immediately. And it causes them to stop and think and maybe calm down, especially if they're getting, you know, going off the wrong path. And so those are just the benefits I see. So um, I agree with them completely. Numerical and multiple choice answer digital tests are not the way to go. Really great digital assessments like Eli was talking about earlier, uh, things like that are more what we feel are probably better than, or at least as good, if not better in, than uh, paper assessments. Yeah, 100% agreed. And, and building on this, I think one of the um, things that we all agree on here is that um, multiple choice assessments are trash and we shouldn't be giving them to students on paper or on computers. Um, 100%. And, 100%. Yes. And also that one of the deep flaws of um, computers is that it's more likely that people are going to give uh, the type of question that's easy for a computer to grade when it's mm -hmm. on a computer. When what you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail and it's really easy to build a multiple choice question on a computer. And so a lot of these assessment platforms do that. And on paper, it's really easy to leave a big blank space and say, show your thinking. But that doesn't mean that we need to constrain ourselves to the crappy ways that people currently use technology in thinking about this. Um, the, the other piece of this that, that we've seen a whole lot of is that even the design of the interface can make it either more or less exciting to explain your thinking, to experiment, to try to revise. And a lot of computerized assessment is designed to make it as frightening as possible. You know, you open an answer and you press the button and it like shakes back and forth and like, ah, what did I do? Um, or it just like gives you a big red X in the corner, like all of these things that aren't inspiring of revision. But you contrast that with something that I didn't even think was assessment until I saw folks um, like, like the folks on this call using it this way. You put students in front of a marble slides activity after teaching them about domain and range. And now the thing that it's inspiring you to do is to keep revising continuously. And there's no penalty for getting it wrong. There's only encouragement for building on top of what you're doing. Um, 
So I think I, I want to shift partly because I think it will make it more likely for uh, our side to, to come out ahead to not compare <laughs> the current awful state of digital assessment with the freeform brilliance of paper, but the, the version that we all think that could be possible on computers compared with the version that we all think could be possible on paper. Can I just acknowledge that Desmos is at the forefront of the interpretive feedback with the cycle of revision and it's it's doing something different than, can I say, any other organization or platform is doing. I, I have to acknowledge, also I'm a Desmos certified presenter, um, that Desmos is doing something that others may not. Um, and it's unfortunate that many of my students, this was their first year that they had experience with Desmos. So, um, it's hard to take one side or another on this. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go in the gray region, but. Um, <laughs> we already have you there for winning. <laughs> I'll join you right there. Absolutely. Yeah, Kathy, what are you all. doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so, I so, can oh, speak, I ahead, can Patricia. agree. Like I can agree not being a Desmos fellow, but I think Desmos is magic. And I think that I completely agree. I think you hit the nail on the head, Eli, when you said, what types of assessments are we actually talking about? And that ease of use is really the challenge that we have. And so when, when I'm thinking like just overall, is it paper or digital? Like my mind goes to like the different digital platforms that just said, hey, enter this number, um, enter this answer, select, you know, select multiple choice. Um, and definitely those, right? Those are the ones that I'm saying. Like if I had to choose between a teacher creating a paper assessment versus a teacher creating a digital assessment, I'm gonna lean paper because likely they're not um, creating a digital assessment that we know can be effective. Um, yeah, Desmos, we love it, spread the word. Kathy, I think you are absolutely okay in saying that they are leading the way, blazing the trail um, because it's true. So Patricia, I wanna jump in real quick. Um, listeners, Desmos is not a sponsor of this episode. Uh, I just wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, so let's pivot away from this, the, the Desmos love train right now and uh, go into, you know, so Kathy, you, you talked about uh, a study from 2020. What I'm curious about, because I, I saw like a similar study and the study was like from like January 2020. I'm wondering if things have shifted. Now, it may not be yours. It might be a different one, but I'm wondering if things have shifted. And for those of you who are in the classroom, if like students nowadays do they prefer more tech because the past two and a half, three and a half years? So Kathy and, and Patricia, like what say you? Um, so I've taught in person for the last two years. Um, and I don't know if it's just my students and I think they're the best students out there. I'm a little biased, but um, my students love a blend of both tech and paper when yes. they're experiencing the math. I do have to be honest. I use the Desmos curriculum, which is, Fabulous, and then I'll leave that aside here. My students love both a mix. Um, in fact, today I was giving them an assignment that they had their choice, paper or technology. Um, I found that when we first came back in person, my students, to be honest, didn't wanna be around the tech. They were tired of the screens. They wanted to be hands-on. They wanted the manipulatives. Um, but I think we see an ebb and flow of that over time. Um, my students, while they are introduced and they, they develop their ideas with the technology, they prefer the assessments on paper. And they were very clear about that. They, they had some great ideas. They told me about experiences with students cheating online when they were all online. They told me experience of they didn't really know what they're doing. They're just clicking through things back in the day. Um, but I think we're going back once again to students enjoying both modalities in the classroom, not just one or the other. Yes, I think that when you start to do some research on what are best assessments, what makes an assessment really great, there's very little talk, I think, about the format in which it's delivered in, because the focus leans so heavily on what is the purpose of assessments. And the overwhelming research that, you know, I have seen out there is like, it's not about grades. It's not about calculating grades. 
It's about informing instruction. It's about improving learning. Marzano's done a ton of research in this area, and it's all about giving clarity to the student before taking the assessment, while they're taking assessment, after they've taken the assessment, that clarity and that feedback. And so paper, because of what we talked about before, um, these digital assessments tend to lean towards multiple choice, fill in the blank, you know, numerical answers, um, paper assessments allow for that a lot easier, a lot more effectively. Not easier, a lot more effectively. <laughs> uh, and going to the other side with Julie and Eli, so are we concerned or worried at all with how technology assessments are going to change with the advancement of artificial intelligence? So, <laughs> yes. Short answer is, is yes. And I think a lot of it is that um, nobody terrifyingly, including the people who work on these systems, actually understand uh, how they work or what the impacts are going to be. Um, but I, I think that that will be true um, across across the board in paper assessments as well, um, and in instruction and, and in all of the different pieces. Um, there's a lot about technology that that scares me, if I'm, if I'm being honest. I think a lot of the ways that it's used um, is really problematic, and this is me jumping into that gray zone, I think. In assessment, it's really tempting, um, and we see this even more in higher ed than in K-12, to use assessment, uh, to use technology as a surveillance tool. And so you're in your computer, and it's tracking your eyes to make sure that you're not looking at someone else, and stories about people, you know, reading the question to themselves, and it thinks that they're cheating because it thinks they're talking to someone. Um, so there are all sorts of things about tech that are, that are really horrifying, and I think this comes down to um, trust that uh, students have in their teacher and the teachers have in their students and that everybody has in the tech in the environment um, that will mitigate this or cause it to be a real problem, no matter what the medium is and no matter what the content is. And for me, it started it started before AI even with PhotoMath and all the other apps that students can use. So, but honestly, I think it's kind of a, a good thing because we shouldn't just be asking kids to do computations and giving numerical answers. You know, they can do that with Photomath. They can do that with Desmos. They can do that with calculators, computers. So the, those apps really forced me and I'm sure many other teachers to come up with more creative questions and more thought provoking questions and that, that allowed students to actually explain math and, and do things that were more thought provoking and what really math is instead of just computation. So I, I think the AI is probably just the next step to that. I want to ask now uh, all of you kind of about how how much do we want uh, tests to reflect like our classroom culture, our classroom routines? Like if we're if we're testing on tech, does that mean we should be doing stuff on tech in the classroom? If we're testing on paper, does that mean we should stick to paper in the classroom? Or like how much of that? ratio do you believe in? And, and I'll start here, over here with Patricia and, and Kathy on team paper. I don't know. I kind of feel like I addressed this earlier. Um, I, I think the best classroom for me as a teacher is one that kind of brings both um, in the paper and pencil and the technology. Um, and my students are used to seeing that in the classroom being demonstrated, whether they're completing their homework on pencil and paper, and we're working on computers during class or vice versa. Um, my students have the opportunity to experience all of those tools. And so um, I have given them the choice if they would like to take their assessments via technology, their summative assessments, let me clarify that. Um, and they choose not to. So I, I feel like whatever the students feel is their best method for assessing is something that teachers should possibly offer. I would agree. I think definitely my answer to this is in the gray zone um, because I think that with everything that we're doing in math education, we are asking students to be able to do things flexibly. We want them to think flexibly. We want them to have number sense that is flexible. We want them to do all these things in flexible ways. And so I think it's important. I think it's good instruction to engage like multiple modes of instruction. I think students should be doing things individually with a partner in small groups, digitally, like not digitally, um, because we want them to be flexible in showing their thinking in multiple ways. And so I think um, 
we do our students a disservice if we don't um, engage all of those different modes of instruction um, in our teaching. And let me bring it over to Eli and Julie too. And I, I'm thinking specifically also about like standardized tests that are going digital for some state exams or SATs. Like, so should we as teachers be giving digital tests to get kids prepared for being on digital? So I love this question um, because this is the reason I started using digital assessments in the first place. I was using Desmos in my class almost every day. And then here came test day and I was like, all right, here's paper and pencil. You know, you don't get to use your tool that, that's helped you so much that we use almost every day. And so that's kind of why I started using Desmos in my assessments or just Desmos assessments completely. Um, I do love a blend of paper and Desmos. In fact, usually when I give a digital assessment, I also give kids paper because kids, I think that's a safety net for kids. They really love to have paper. And some of my assessments, they can do it all on paper if they want, and then they can just work with Desmos to check. And I give kids that option as well, like Kathy was saying. So I think that, you know, I love the, I don't know who came up with the gray area thing, but I really love the gray area because of course, like everything else, uh, the best thing is usually a mix, right? Um, and as far as the standard I test, standardized test going that was test testing goes <laughs> um the standardized testing was in my opening thing yes i feel that if students have never used a digital assessment and then they have to do it on a high stakes exam for the first time that could be stress inducing for students so even if you know teachers didn't do digital assessments a lot even a few times to practice before a high stakes exam is a great idea in fact even if you're giving any kind of digital assessment with my students, I always give like, I give a, I let them practice a digital assessment before they do the real thing so we can see what problems they have and they can ask me questions just to increase their comfort level. So with any anything that's new, like a digital dig, digital assessing or anything that you do new with your students, it's always great to practice in advance. So I absolutely think that they should be doing a little bit of practice before they have to do the real thing. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll join everyone in this gray zone because I, I agree with everything that I've heard here, including that having a variety is really, really important. Um, and this is an instruction and this is an assessment. And I think it's informative and it's summative and it's interim. Um, being able to do work on paper is really important. Having a section of some parts of what we're doing that doesn't allow a calculator is really important. But then also having some parts that are open book and you have access to the computer is much better preparation for the real tasks that we're trying to prepare students for. And so we need to make sure that we have that as well. We need the we need the whole um, variety, I think, the, the whole spectrum here. Um, and, and I think building on that, there are things that are possible to assess in these different environments that you can't do in some of the others. If we're trying to assess how well a, a student in elementary school understands addition and they have access to a four-function calculator, we can't learn anything. We're not going to see the interesting mistakes. If we're trying to um, sense whether a student has an intuitive uh, understanding of slope and they have access to a graphing calculator, we're not going to be able to, to see that. Um, but on the other hand, if we are establishing that and we want to ask something that requires that students can really efficiently explore a variety of those and you don't have access to a calculator, then suddenly we're not able to assess that. So, so we need the whole range. And, and to me, one of the what, what I hear from Kathy is so resonant where students actually saying, I would rather do this on paper than on a computer. Um, I think we should listen to that really loudly always. And I also hear that not as a sign that computers are inherently gonna be bad at this, but that the ways that people use computers are really bad. In writing class, Students are not choosing to write their essays by hand. They're choosing to do it in Google Docs because it makes their life better. And so what I hear out of that, both as you know the CEO of an education company, but also I think all of us who are pushing the space forward and demanding things of the people who build products is saying it's not good enough. Not that it can't be good enough, but that it currently isn't. Students are choosing to not do it, not because computers are bad, but because we're asking them to put numbers into boxes and press buttons that then tell them that they're wrong which is not what computers are good for. Can I, can I just follow up real quick? Eli, you brought up a good point about like, you know, an elementary student getting tested on like addition or multiplication and we don't wanna have them test with a calculator in hand, right? We're, we're, we're testing on their understanding or fluency there. Can I just hear from everyone just very quickly, like where age level or grade level wise, do you see digital tests starting to be okay in some sense? Like maybe not in kindergarten or first grade, but at what point, where would you put it? Just briefly, start with Eli and Julie. Yeah, I can start here with, I think that 
there are a couple places where it's really obvious. Like in college, we definitely want kids on computers um, or at least to have access to it. Um, and the best tests that I did in college were open book in 24 hours and whatever tool you have at your disposal. Um, very clearly, we want to be on that side of, of use every tool that you can. And in kindergarten, I don't want kids in front of screens ever, <laughs> just like not a moment. And I don't know where those cross, um, but maybe starting in kind of the middle school area is where we want to be starting to, to incorporate this. Um, that... Yeah, Julia, I see you nodding along. Yeah, middle school. I, I taught middle school for several years and, um, you know, sixth grade, not as much, but they did enjoy it. But especially starting in like pre-algebra, when you really start putting together the, you know, an equation and a graph and what it means, I think that's when it's important for kids to be able to see it and to play with the marble slides and to actually um, experiment with that. And like when you type different things, what happens to the graph? So, um, you know, I, I think especially when students start with, with the multiple rep representations of what a function is, uh, probably like, you know, sixth, seventh grade. Um, but before then, I, I'm with Eli. Little kids and don't need screens. And so they have Patricia, too many screens as it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Patricia and Kathy, just in that gray area, if you are doing a little bit of, of digital stuff, is middle school a good place or early or later? Where would you be okay with it? I think the reality is that state testing kind of dictates when uh, when those digital assessments come into play. And then it brings back the previous question that we just discussed, like, we don't want the technology to be a barrier to students showing their learning and showing their understanding of math. And so we, it's our, you know, we have a responsibility to help those elementary age students um, to engage in some practice of navigating the digital tool. And so I believe that there's a space for, there's a space in elementary school for that because of the nature of when we start um, state testing our students. I know here in the state of Idaho, we start in third grade. Um, and so then we are doing some things in already in kindergarten, very, very minimal, um, but just, you know, kind of benchmark testing, diagnostic testing that is on um, a digital platform um, in kindergarten so that we can start to kind of prepare them for those things. Um, but I would also agree that, uh, and I think I also agree that middle school is a really great place to start bringing in those digital assessments. And I think bringing in those kind of formative digital assessments, that's in the middle school space. Um, whereas I see in elementary school, because of our state testing, um, there's a need for us to use um, some digital platform for those summative assessments, like kind of end of the year um, benchmark um, assessments. So I teach sixth graders right now, um, and they love seeing the interpreted feedback in tape diagrams or what happens when they're introduced to exponents. And they love seeing, they say it's really satisfying to see the animation of what happens when they put the math into the computer. Um, so definitely, I feel like by sixth grade, as a parent of a first grader, um, I've seen him work on some math platforms online and I feel like he does better with the hands-on physical um, opportunities that he's given. He's a kinesthetic learner. So um, I'd like to keep him off of screens as long as I can, but um, he does enjoy a good uh, logic game on a computer, which isn't assessments, but. Well, and Kathy, that's actually a perfect segue um, because I wanna go to Eli and Julie with these uh, computer-based like tech assessments, like are we testing on like students' math skills? Or are we testing on computer skills? That's a great question. Um, definitely math skills more than computer skills, which is why it's important. You know, if you're not using technology in your classroom, then you don't want to give a an assessment with technology because students aren't familiar with it. So, like I said before, before I ever give an assessment to my students using Desmos or any other digital platform. We've definitely done it in class enough that they're comfortable. We've practiced with it. Um, that's not a problem I've had in my classroom when I give a digital assessment just because I've prepared them. So I think it's like any other any other thing you do in your class. Uh, you don't want to throw a test at some you know, it's, it's students who've never worked on the platform before. You don't want to be testing their computer skills. And there are ways around that. You, there are ways that, you know, especially with computation layer, you can you can make the assessments very user-friendly for students and and you know um like you can put 
I would a lot of times type y equals so they would know to put the rest of the equation in there or I would type part of the equation into the computer before I gave them the assessment so that wouldn't something they typed incorrectly wouldn't impair their answer um, and also that's a great thing when I'm assessing or I'm watching them as they work if something is going wrong you can kind of watch screens and that'll pop up and then you can like you know type a little note and correct them and help them out so definitely math skills over computer skills and Eli I'm gonna let you uh, respond to it and I'm thinking like more like with the marble slides we all keep talking about by the way if you Listeners, if you don't know what Marvel slides are, definitely go check them out. Still not a sponsor, but definitely go check them out. Um, but if we're thinking about like the Marvel slides, like the manipulation of, of the tech element of it, like it, does that is that a barrier for some students? Yeah, I think this is such an important question, and it takes me right back to to Kathy's um, survey, where I think that there are versions of um, digital where the barrier is the digital. And I think that's part of why it's really unpleasant for folks is it's very easy to come into a computer. I've seen, I've, I've felt it all the time. I still don't know how to use Google Calendar, for example. It's an absolute disaster for me. Um, and I feel really stupid every time I'm in front of Google Calendar. And it's not that I don't understand dates, although that's also kind of true. It's that I don't understand that interface. Um, and so it's possible to do that. And it's also possible to make it so that the interface is helping you. And, and a lot of what Julie described is these really subtle cues and, and just being very attuned to um, what people expect makes a big difference. Um, I don't think that that this is a problem that we can avoid. And, and I wanna give an example of the opposite of this, um, which is paper SAT and students learning how to use their TI-84 graphing calculator. And for years, the thing that we have heard is that schools have to do boot camps for like days or weeks before the test of like, you want to plot a table of data. Here's the four pages of the manual that does this. And here's the sequence of button presses that you need to do. And that there's tutoring companies whose entire job is to teach students how to like use their calculator more effectively and efficiently than someone else. Um, and then you have these huge inequities of students who can't afford their own calculator and using a shared one and don't have time to practice at home. Um, and, and a big part of what we've tried to do uh, with the graphing calculator is say, if you show up and do kind of what you think will work, hopefully it will work. And anytime that it doesn't, that's on us. We need to make it better. If you want to zoom in and out, you like pinch the screen, which now kids are all used to because you've got a map. You don't need to find the correct menu. Um, and it's free so you can practice at home. Um, so that ideally, just like Julie was saying, like you come in and it's something that you have some familiarity with, um, because this is not something we're going to be able to get away from unless we say no technology of any sort when you get there. And then again, the burden is to make sure that the technology is good enough and intuitive enough and does what you expect often enough that we can have that be kind of transparent. And the thing that the students are spending their time thinking about and worrying about is actually the math itself. So this actually brings me to the final question of the round and I'm going to send it to Kathy and, and Patricia. Um, so if we are going to go with like the paper tests, are we ignoring the reality of, of for students after school? Like when they get outside of the school years, are we ignoring that reality by only doing like the paper tests? My gut reaction is no, because my students take standardized tests on the computers. Um, I'm lucky enough that I do use the Desmos platform in my classroom so they can use the Desmos calculator and those platforms. I think it's all about balance. Um, maybe I'll do the practice on the technology and the test on paper. I, I think we are setting them up for the best of both worlds. I would agree with that. I don't think we're doing students a disservice by having that mix or, or prim even primarily using paper assessments because I think ultimately what we want students, at, you know, when they walk out of our math classes, we want them to know and love math. That's our ultimate goal. Like our ultimate goal is for them to be really confident in what they're in, in how they think about math and how they process mathematical ideas. And um, it's not the assessment that is going to make or break that student's future. It's really about like, do we know where our students are in their understanding and when I look at my assessment, can I tell where students thinking is? If you're able to do that in a digital platform because you are a rock star teacher and you know all the things Desmos, let's say, um, awesome, use that digital platform. But 
at the end of the day, like that paper assessment will do it 100% of the time. Like it will always give space to capture student thinking. You'll always be able to track what students know, what they are able to do and what they don't know and provide next steps. You'll always be able to look at that student work and like pinpoint the feedback. Like I said, even if it's blank, even if that test is blank, that tells you something and you can pull that student aside and have a conversation and say, hey, tell me what happened on this problem. Why is it blank? Um, I just think when I look at digital versus paper, like paper 100% of the time provides us that evidence of student thinking. Um, digital can, but not 100% of the time. And on that note, that concludes our questioning round. We will now end by giving each side two minutes to make their final arguments to you. And we're gonna begin with the side arguing for digital exams, Julie and Eli, go away. So we all know that digital assessments can help prepare students for high stake exams that include technology. We really feel that we should have good digital assessments. We're not talking about multiple choice and numerical answers. We are talking about incorporating really great digital assessments into your classroom. And again, we feel this should be married and with a mix of paper assessments because paper is not going away, but digital is coming. And so I feel like as, as math teachers, we need to embrace that. Since we're using it so much in our classrooms, we should afford students the opportunity to also test digitally, especially if it can relieve their stress and give them feedback and help them learn and discover while they're assessing. Yeah, and add, adding on this, I think something all of us agreed on is that um, bubble tests have already gone the way of the dinosaur and multiple choice online tests should do the exact same thing. Um, and so the, the challenge here is how to make sure that we're using these tools to their greatest potential. And I think that comes from folks who are building the tools, but it also comes from the brilliant educators on this call and everyone listening to this to push really hard and say, this is not good enough. And so I like to imagine what is possible when we think about computers. And I, I picture students trying things and getting feedback on what they're trying that is interpretive of what they did so that they can revise it. Having it be so fun that they really want to keep going with it and building on top of what they've done. Um, some of these things that we've seen in the best lessons also carries over into the most interesting assessments that can help inform students, help inform their teachers, help make math more joyful. Uh, as Patricia said, at the end of the day, our goal is for more students to come out feeling like they're math students and feeling like they love math. And if we use appropriate tools strategically, including digital when it's appropriate, I think that we can help move that needle. Thank you. And with the final word, we have the side arguing for paper exams. Kathy and Patricia, you're up. Assessments are a critical part of our learning cycle, not only for the students, but also for the teachers. They are an opportunity to capture student thinking and allow teachers to inform instruction. Assessments can provide meaningful feedback that encourages reflection and revision of student understanding. And while there is definitely a space for digital tools in the classroom, paper assessments afford more opportunity to think, create, and revise learning. And ultimately, we agree that balance is key and meeting the needs of our students is a priority and sharing the joy of mathematics is what it's all about. And thank you all. That concludes this debate. Wow, that was a, gave us a lot to think about. And not only were we talking about digital versus paper, but we just talked about like what is an assessment and why we assess and just got into so many wonderful uh, channels of thought. And now it is up to our listeners to take a moment, ponder the arguments, share with some friends, some colleagues, and consider what resonated with you. Be sure to go to our Twitter at Debate Math Pod to share your thoughts on this debate. What arguments stuck with you? And again, huge thanks to all four of our guests. You were thoughtful. You were respectful. Uh, our listeners can't see this, but there's some some light smack talk happening in the chat, and it was a lot of fun. You all met lovely in this gray area in between both sides. And thanks to all those uh, that are listening. We hope you enjoyed this as much as we did, and we hope that you learned. Uh, and as we wrap up, Julie, where can listeners find you? Hi, yes, um, I'm on Twitter at, um, at Jay Wilbach, and I write a blog called I Speak Math. So come and check it out. And Eli, where can listeners find you? 
Uh, so I check Twitter maybe once every two months. That's my current Twitter policy. Uh, but I will check direct messages there. And you can email me at Eli at Desmos.com or feedback at Desmos.com or support at Desmos.com or info at Desmos.com or really anything at Desmos.com will probably end up at me one way or another. And Kathy, where can listeners find you? You can find me on the Twitters, uh, Kathy Hen underscore. And Patricia? You can find me on Twitter sharing all the great math learning going on in West Ada at VBerg Math or check out my blog, patriciavandenberg.com. Wonderful, and that concludes our debate. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.